Hello, everybody. This is a video podcast made by the Iran Desk for the ITS Astana series podcast, video podcast. My name is Shahina Modares. I'm the director of the Iran Desk at ITS Astana, and today we have the immense pleasure of having Professor Paula Rivetti with us, who is a distinguished scholar in the field of Iran and its politics. I will be accompanied by two of my brilliant colleagues, Ilaria Larusso and also Margherita Cesarini. It will be my pleasure to give the floor to Ilaria. And once again, Paola, thank you for joining us. It's an honor to have you. Yes. So, hello, Paola. Again, thanks also on my behalf for taking part in this video podcast. Uh, the topic uh, of today is uh, Iran in the aftermath of uh, Maat Amini's death. Uh, and I will start with the first question. So it has been one year and a half, more or less, since the first circulation of the news that Maaz Amini was killed while she was under custody of the morality police in Iran. The way in which we saw protests uh, spread out, at least from the perspective of uh, Western media, uh, really made it seem like that was the quote unquote last drop we could say. Uh, can you retrace briefly what was the context that preceded the assassination of Maaz Amini and what was the actual polit political meaning of this event precisely in this context? Hi everyone and thanks so much for, for having me and inviting me. Um, so it's I, it's very important to uh, contextualize the uh, woman life freedom uprising uh, of last year in in Iran. Um, so what what happened, as we all know, is that a young woman of Kurdish uh, Kurdish Iranian woman, Masal Jinamini, um, you know, was uh, I, I mean died while in custody of the morality police, and this um, was the you know was the event that actually. Um, um, uh, made this uh, major uh, uprising erupting in uh, in Iran. As we know, it lasted several months, starting in mid September with the you know the the, the death of Amini, um, and it kind of you, you know the very last news that we have. Uh, I would say go back to the spring summer of 2023. Um, so, um, Masa um, Gina Amini's death is possibly, uh, you know, the most tragic episode, not the only one, because, uh, as you know, um, another young woman, uh, you know, died uh, recently in, uh, in Tehran in very similar circumstances. But back then, so back in September 2022, was definitely the most tragic example of something that had been going on for a while, which is the um, securitization of the public space uh, through different means. One of these means was the morality police. So the morality police had already been under the attention of the public for months uh, in September 2022, uh, because we have had other episodes of the police not only harassing, but also violently reacting to, um, you know, sometimes to the counter reaction of women or people being harassed by the police in the first place. Um, we also, um, you know, we had the, there, there were many different instances when, when this happened. Uh, we had public um, trials of women that were brought into in front of the courts because of, uh, you know, because by the morality police. So in, in uh, you know, in attempts at, um, um, you know, controlling policing, women's presence and women's appearance uh, in, in the street and, and, and the public space. So. The death of uh, Gina Masamini has to be contextualized in this longer story of um, securitization of the public space, of um, um, a renewed efforts by the state to policing women's bodies. Um, we had uh, a couple of important, two important laws um, and legislative reforms that have taken place uh, before the death of Masamini, and and later on, uh, one is the uh, law on on the veil and chastity, um, which basically uh, reinforced the control. So the the um, um, the um, 
obligatory veiling, uh, obligatory veiling in workplaces uh, made it more difficult to for women to access uh, contraception and um, you know other medical technologies when it comes to reproduction and sexual health. Uh, so this has been contextualized in this in this larger story of the state, uh, you know, attempting at not only securitizing but specifically targeting uh, women's bodies and women's bodily autonomy. So um, I do agree that it was a last drop. Um, uh, I mean, this is a big statement, but I, I kind of, um, you know, I kind of think that, um, you know, Masa Gina Samini's death uh, has been a turning point in a larger process, which is still going on of, uh, let's say, distancing um, of the state and the political elites from the popular sentiments and um, I think also, that, um, you know, it's been a while that uh, for, 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 for some times now, um, you know, the Iranian state has been um, losing legitimacy uh, through its people, uh, not only because of the, you know, disregard towards, uh, you know, human rights, as we all know, but also because of its incapacity of providing uh, economic security. Um, you know, sanctions, of course, are a big factor in this. And, um, you know, and sanctions have been imposed on the Islamic Republic. So it's it's not kind of, you know, internal, if you want a factor explaining this, uh, uh, you know, loosening of credibility and efficacy of the state, but also very internal and very domestic corruption or mismanagement of the economy are, you know, a factor in, uh, in this uh, incapacity of the state and this growing incapacity of the state to deliver. But also security wise, we have seen, you know, the Islamic State, for instance, being able to strike uh, and attack uh, on Iran soil. So I think these are, uh, you know, elements and factors that's, that uh, really tell us a larger story, which is the story of a state that is increasingly in difficulty, is increasingly, you know, weaker um, in many different ways, popular legitimacy wise, but also economic, um, you know, economically and, and security wise. Uh, and also is a state that is reacting to um, this process of weakening, my personal opinion, in the wrong way by becoming more and more authoritarian. Yes, yeah, thank you very much for the complete answer. I think it really helps to situate why we had such a, a huge uprising after what happened. Um, I would like for the second question to turn uh, our focus a little bit more on the movement aspect, as you said. Um, and uh, specifically, uh, in September 2022, you wrote an article for uh, Jacobin in which you called the uh, movement that fueled the, these protests in the aftermath of uh, Amin's death as a new movement with ancient roots. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on this? Sure. So it's 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 a move it's a new movement with ancient roots because it builds on decades of um, you know mobilization, feminist mobilization, but not 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 exclusively feminist mobilizations. Um, so the feminist movement in Iran has a you know long history. Um, it has been, um, I think, a movement that, um, contrary to other social movements, has been able to navigate the uh, constraints that, you know, the authority, the political authoritarianism of the state was, uh, you know, what was imposing on it. It has been able to uh, change strategy according to the contexts, to kind of, uh, you know, it has been able to adopt for to to, to kind of, um, you know, adopt more lobbying like strategies for. For legal reform, but also at the same time organizing and mobilizing when allowed, organizing and mobilizing women in the streets. So it's it's been extremely flexible and able to respond to the challenges that, of course, have been changing with the you know with with the context. So in that sense, it has you know ancient roots. Um, it builds on um, um, it builds on the uh, work that uh, human rights and feminist lawyers such as Nasrin Sotoudeh and Arges Mohammadi, who are today incarcerated, you know, have been doing and have been, um, you know, carrying out across the decades. But it is at the same time very new movement. Um, 
first of all, it's a new generation a police report that was released, um, you know, in October. So not that long after the, um, you know, the the the, the protest started. Um, declared that the average age of the people arrested was 15 years of age. So extremely young, uh, you know, protesters. Um, of course, I mean, we have intergenerational participation. We have had intergenerational participation, but this is an important element that tells us, um, you know, that there is a new generation that is participating I mean, was participating in the protest that um, I think most importantly has a different relation to the state. Um, so I, I, you know, this is anecdotal evidence, but, you know, for instance, in my work, um, you know, have been going back and forth um, from and to Iran since 2005 and, you know, and working on, on different topics, but social movements as well, and engaging, you know, activists in different contexts and so forth and so on. I have seen, you know, how um, generations and and uh, political attitudes and political analysis have been changing with the changing of the, the you know, the, the change of the generations. Um, the younger generation, so, um, you know, people who are significantly younger than me, we're talking about, you know, people in their 20s, if not younger, uh, come from a very different, uh, you know, political experience of the state. Uh, people my age, I'm in my early 40s, so people of my age, uh, you know, had experience of, um, has experienced hope of, uh, you know, an internal reform being possible, has experienced a type of political participation that was somehow related to this possibility of transforming the state, this possibility of reforming the Islamic Republic. I think with the defeat of this uh, political project of reformism, um, also the you know the, the new generations adopted a new, a different, let's say, a different approach, uh, hopes for reforming the state from within. So institutional reforms are really low at the moment, um, not only because the um, because of political mistakes and mistaken political political strategies that the reformist elite have adopted, you know, in the past, but also because um, you know the state has become in the past, say, 10, 15 years, more authoritarian. Um, maybe we, we can talk this about about this in you know in one of the other uh, questions. But if we look at, for instance, the uh, you know at the upcoming um, parliamentary election, we can see that very clearly. The um, the poli even the you know within the political elites, the representatives that are allowed to take part in the institutional political game are fewer and fewer. This means that the the ideas that are tolerated and are considered as legitimate by the state have become, you know, fewer. And the, the political space where, 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 you know, we can actually ex exercise politics has become, you know, smaller and smaller. Uh, so in this sense, I think the, you know, the, the, the woman life freedom uprising presented some a lot of actually elements of novelty not only because of this new generation the structures the political structures that were in place the consolidated political movement and their ability to lead uh, you know the protests um were not there or were significantly you know weaker than they would have been in the past uh, so these are elements of novelty but also the element of novelty another element of novelty comes from the fact that it we, protesters and iranians have to deal with a state that has profoundly changed um, you know, has profoundly changed in the past decade and has changed and has become more authoritarian and therefore allowing for less, for a small, you know, for reducted, produced political participation. Thank you once more. Um, we have until now talked about the domestic uh, political landscape in Iran, and I would like to draw attention now more on the ge geopolitical point of view. Do you think that the Iranian government felt somewhat uh, damaged by the domestic turmoil or its position remained unchanged vis-a-vis -vis especially its competitors? Thank you.
Thanks for the question. Uh, it's it's a very important question, especially if you are considering what's going on in Palestine and Gaza in particular. Um, I do not think, you, you know, I, I think that it, when we talk about geopolitics and not exclusively geopolitics of the Middle East or in the Middle East, um, you know that that what what happens um in israel what 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 is the attitude um you know of of israel dealing with uh, not only you know the the palestinian authorities or the political elites of palestine but also what about the ongoing colonization of uh, you know of the occupied territories and not exclusively so i think uh, all these questions are part and parcel of the same you know of the same conversation um and I mean, um, you're right, domestic events and domestic developments, domestic politics, you know, more generally speaking, um, and geopolitical decisions and strategies are never disjointed. So um, so I think that, you know, when it comes to the woman life freedom uprising, I think that the state has taken it as an opportunity to, um, uh, to uh, consolidate, if you want, or you know strengthen itself um the woman if, if we look at the state after the woman life of freedom uprising which has been the biggest and most threatening challenge to the stability of the iranian state since the revolution so we're, we're talking about a, you know an unprecedented uh you know event um, but if we, look, if we look at the Iranian state after uh, 2023, what we see is a state that has, you know, as I was saying before, consolidated its, uh, you know, an, an authoritarian approach to politics. It's almost as if the Iranian state is today way less concerned about popular legitimacy than it was, you know, 15 years ago. One of the characteristics of the Islamic Republic is that it has always, um, you know, in spite of the authoritarian the authoritarian approach to politics that has consist consistently has had across the decades, but anyway, it has always, um, you know, paid attention to to popular legitimacy. Um, it is almost as if today that is not the case anymore, and I think the geopolitics partially explains, you know, explains this. When states feel feel threatened. Um, uh, when state feel threatened, they often react by increasing, uh, you know, by strengthening, let's say, their authoritarian approach to politics. Uh, the Iranian state, um, you know, it would be unfair to say that the Iranian state has reacted by becoming more authoritarian because of the woman life freedom uprising. I don't think that's that's you know that that's a fair analysis. I think that this is much more related to the turmoil and the geopolitical transformations um, that have been taking place in the region, um, you know, since 2010, and the consolidation of an extremely anti-Iran and anti-Shia environment in the region. So think of the, um, the, you know, the, 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 let's say the alliance, you know, more or less formal alliance that we have had between Israel, Egypt, the US, especially with Trump, U.S. Trump uh, with Trump, um, you know Saudi Arabia. Um, so that that is an ax, you know, an axis, if you want, that was uh, also built on, you know, a shared anti-Iranian sentiment. Um, we have that. We have had that. We have had, um, you know, of course, the uh, the presence and the the activism of the Islamic State, so-called Islamic State, Daesh, in in the region, which you know, has of course increased the 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 I mean the, the insecurity, not only perceived, uh, but the actual insecurity of the Iranian state with the two attacks, as we know, three attacks that you know, you know of on uh, sovereign Iranian um, territory. Um, so I think that um you know I I think that the uh, geopolitics has you know is as is a big role in explaining you know the um the development and the evolution of the Iranian state much more than the the woman life freedom uh the woman life freedom uprising has had when it comes to the Iranian state feeling threatened you know and feeling insecure um you know as i said geopolitics has has you know has a big role in in explaining this Uh, 
Thank you so much, Paula. You brilliantly uh, described and mentioned the situation that was created after the tragic death of Masamin Yuvet. However, I have two curiosities. First of all, repeatedly you refer to the Islamic Republic as an authoritarian regime. And considering the very fact that you mentioned that the focus of the regime from the political life or biased politicals has been put on the real life or the bias itself, it's a sign of a totalitarian regime. Would you care to uh, describe and elaborate a little on this? And my second curiosity is this, considering the existing situation, how do you think the tragic death of Masajina Amini can change itself into a social transformation in the near future in Iran? Thanks for the question. So if I understand correctly, the first one, um, you know, you want me to elaborate on why the Iranian state is an authoritarian state. Is that correct? Why, is, why do you think it's authoritarian, not totalitarian? Oh, right. OK. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the, the Iranian state, it's or at least this is, you know, what scholars agree on, um, you know, has always been um, kind of defying categories of a mainstream political science categories of, you know, authoritarianism, totalitarianism and so forth and so on because of its revolutionary nature, which in itself, you know, and, and I think for a substantial time of its, uh, you know, its existence um, has incorporated an element of political legitimacy, um, which is, I mean, which is not a, you know, a, a, a unique case. All post-colonial, you know, states have, you know, have um, have this element, you know, in in their history. Um, so what we usually understand, uh, you know, as totalitarianism is a state that is, um, you know, does not allow for any um, any type of political participation, any type of polit even political ideational articulation, so ideology and ideas, you know, opinions as well, um, that can have an actual practical traction in when it comes to political action. Um, so any of, um, you know, ideational forms of participation that are outside or can be considered critical of, you know, state ideology are not, uh, you know, are not allowed. So this is, you know, usually the mainstream definition of totalitarianism. We have seen a very different story in, you know, in 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 Iran, in the in the Islamic Republic. So since um, 1979, um, not it, this is not only a story of, uh, you know, revolts, uprisings, you know, smaller, bigger uh, mobilizations, but it is also a story of um, forms of political participation that were critical of the state, um, sometimes extremely critical, that were to you know, larger, lesser extent tolerated, that even incorporated for part of the, you know, of the life of, of the Islamic Republic, even incorporated into, um, you know, into institutional politics. Uh, so this is why the Islamic Republic has been referred to as an authoritarian state, sometimes as an hybrid authoritarian state with elements of democracy, such as, you know, um, um, a parliamentary life, um, elections and so forth and so on, along with elements of authoritarian, you know, politics. Um, anyway, a limit is put on, you know, on, on, on participation. There is a screening of candidates when it comes to electoral politics and so forth and so on. So as, as I said before, I... I think that the Islamic Republic is going, you know, a slightly different direction at the moment, which again is not very dissimilar from the direction that other states in the region, and not only in the region, in Europe as well, in North America as well, in Brazil, in Latin America, uh, and so forth and so on, are taking, which is a, becoming a much more authoritarian state. So restricting significantly, uh, you know, something that we can call the, the political, the 
the political space that is actually actionable. So where, you know, people on which can, people can actually in a safe way uh, organize and mobilize. This is not different from what is happening in Italy. This is not different from what is happening in France, you know, North America. So in that sense that, you know, Iran and the Islamic Republic are not on Mars. They are located, you know, in the world and of course are part of large geopolitical, uh, you know, development and evolutions um, and evolutions. Um, so when it comes to the last questions about what are the possibilities for, let's say, future reiteration of, um, you know, of something like a, um, the Woman Life Freedom Uprisings or even um, you know, a kind of a more more concerning or bigger challenge to the stability of the Islamic Republic. I think that at the moment uh, there are very little possibilities, um, mostly because of you know the junction of a in a geopolitical situation that is you know kind of puts states alarms the states. So the reaction of, you know, as I said before, a lot of the state is the one of becoming more authoritarian, therefore more controlling, and therefore more repressive of forms of, uh, you know, dissent, forms of organized, you know, politics. Um, there is often this, uh, you know, this contradiction, which is a contradiction we also see, I think we also see in Italy, um, but you know, it's if you if you participate in a university class in in Iran, you will see an extremely open environment, and you know people voicing opinions that are, you know, that would not be perhaps safe to voice in you know in the public. But what I'm trying to say is that it's the the way in which the state controls opinions is very different from the way in which the state controls organized politics. The problem is organizing politically is not voicing, you know, critiques of the state. That is no problem. The point is when those critiques, you know, are put in practice and are practiced as, you know, as, as actual politics, as actual opposition. That's when, you know, things become uh, less acceptable and less tolerated. Thank you so much. Once again, thank you so much, Professor Paolo Rivetti, for joining us and the rest of you for watching us. Stay tuned until our next podcast. Thank you very much for having me.